Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth that no matter how we feel about ourselves, that we are daughters of you. We are daughters of the King. And Lord, I thank you for this um, incredible scripture that we're going to be taking a look at this morning that in a strong, strong way teaches us the truth of that, that concept, Lord, that we belong to you. We are your daughters. We are royal princesses, daughters of the King. Wow. And so, Lord, I just pray this morning, Holy Spirit, would you... <clears throat> work with us? Would you be in our midst? Would you speak to our hearts in a mighty way? Lord, we open ourselves up to you to hear that concept that we need to hear so desperately. So be here this morning, Lord Jesus. I know you are, and I just pray that you would strongly minister to us and speak to our hearts. Lord, I thank you for these women who have gathered to learn more about you and to be a part of um, a, a group of women they can share their hearts about your scripture and what you're teaching all of us. So Lord, we just commit this year 2024 to you. May it be a year of wonderful growth. Lord, we are going through trying times internationally, nationally, and within our in our own lives and many lives that are represented in these um, small groups together that are dealing with very difficult times. And so Lord, thank you for your word that speaks directly to our hearts as we're going through trying times. So we love you, we praise you, we commit this uh, rest of this year to you, the study to you, and this morning to you. And it's in the mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, welcome back. Yay! <laughs> to a to a fresh start, right? 2024. And we have some new faces in our midst. So welcome new faces. We have, yes, we have old faces. Oh. Why are you laughing so hard? I'm just, <laughs> anyway, but um, as we begin a new year, we have all, I don't know about you, but we, you know, we have, a, even if we don't write them down and make it really, um, technical or whatever, we have New Year's resolutions, don't we? We have these ideas of, okay, this is a fresh year, yay, I can finally lose those 20 pounds, um, I can get a little bit more organized, and, um, you know, we have all these, these plans of fresh, and that's a good thing, but, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's really important for us as we're looking at having a new start, to look at what's really important as far as a new start is going to be. And we'll talk about that in just uh, a minute. But, you know, I miss my, do you miss your Christmas decorations? Yes. Yeah, yes and no. I'm hearing all that out there. But, um, you know, I miss that. I miss all the hustle and bustle of the celebrations and, and you know, all that and, and shopping for gifts. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of shopping sitting on my couch dialing up Amazon. But anyway, we, we miss all of that. But on the other side, isn't it wonderful to get a little bit of peace and quiet? Yeah. To get all of the beautiful but busy, busy, busy decorations down and kind of get back to normal. And if you had a, a live tree, anybody have a live tree here? Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> then you have to start sweeping out the pine needles and all those kinds of things. And so in a way, it's just a really wonderful time for us to get back to a little bit more simplicity, isn't it? We enjoy it, but it's kind of nice to be back. So, and especially back to in being in Bible study together. I love it, studying God's Word. I think it's interesting, I think it's great, and I think it's good at the new year to be introspective, but in order to put all that in proper perspective, proper perspective, get it out, to help us, we actually need to get traction in self-analysis and self-improvement. We need to do that, don't we? We need to be looking at ourselves and thinking, okay, we have a fresh start. What can I work on? What can I do better in? How can the Lord minister more to me? How can I be more of a servant for Him? And, and we need to do all those things. But I think the most important thing to consider is what our lives should look like. What should our lives look like? What should be the important things, the most important things to, to consider other than getting organized and the weight and all those kinds of things? How perfect for a brand new year 
to be self-analytical. That's important. But what we want to really be self-analytical about is our hearts and where we are with that and how, we are, how we're relating with the Lord. And to think about the most important consideration, which is on your outline, what is the daughter of a king, the king, like? What is the daughter of the king like? And so as we begin this new year and ponder that concept, we're going to begin our study in a beloved informative psalm that is not one of the Psalms of Ascent. Next week, we'll get back to the Psalms of Ascent, but right now we're gonna take a break as we begin our study um, in Psalm 119. So I know you already probably have it because you talked about it in your small groups, but Psalm 119 verses nine through 16. It is the longest psalm, the longest song, heart song, in the Bible. In fact, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible as well, longest chapter. So today, our focus, 9 through 16, addresses purity, purity. We're going to take a look at that and see what that means. Now, all of us, have you, um, when you were a little girl, did you watch all the, the princess movies, Cinderella, Snow White, and, and all that? My granddaughters are obsessed with the uh, princess concept. And in fact, my youngest, Hope, four years old, she has all the, the costumes that she wants to wear. And, you know, and she'll go to an event and have a, a princess costume on. And I think as women, we kind of obsessed about that, you know, even in our day. But um, I think the interest from that, in that, comes from an innate desire that all of us have to, quote, live happily ever after. Doesn't every fairy, fairy tale kind of end? And they lived happily ever after, and we're like, wow, that just sounds wonderful. And so I think that that desire to be a princess has that, uh, that concept that, that we want to live happily ever after. And we also want to be a princess in the sense that we're special, that we're special. There's something unique and different about us. We're a princess. We want to be special and different and um, that we are worth being loved and paid attention to. We all have that desire, and here it is. Are you ready? God designed us to be that way. He designed us to desire to have a, be special, to be a princess, quote, unquote. If we have a personal relationship with the king of kings, guess what? We are princesses. We are princesses. In fact, royal princesses of the king of kings, the most high God, the Alpha and Omega, and the names go on and on and on. We get to be princesses of the most high God. That should be life-changing, shouldn't it? That should really affect how we view ourselves and how we react to other, other, uh, other people. But unfortunately, we don't feel like princesses too much because our culture has played a role in that. Unless we look like Taylor Swift or um, have a, a, a lucrative career with Amazon or Apple or um, uh, have a, you know, or, or we're a Hollywood star or something, we just don't feel that feeling of, I'm special, I'm a princess, I belong to God. We, we really struggle with that, I think. But in order to understand that we're indeed princesses of, of the king, capital K, we need to understand what a daughter of the Most High God looks like. So first on your outline, number A, her focus is upward. Her focus is upward. Before we uh, get into Psalm 119, Proverbs 31, 30 addresses this hugely. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Isn't that strong? A woman who fears the Lord is to be uh, praised. So for us to truly understand who we are and who we are to God, we must fear the Lord. In, in other words, look up. Look up to God. Get our gaze on the true king who makes us true princesses. We need to get our gaze up. Now, fear in the original language in Hebrew did not mean quaking in our boots with you know, fear. It, the word is ja'ah, and it means respect, reverence, and worship. 
When we say fear the Lord, it doesn't mean quake in our boots. It means have an awe, be awe-inspired by who he is, and to, be, to have respect and reverence and worship for him. And yes, trembling in the sense that we're trembling in awe of who he is, that he loves us so much and he's so powerful and he is the creator of the universe and on and on it goes. So um, we want to uh, be fearful of God in the sense that we, we're awestruck by him. And we need to see ourselves as our awe-inspired father sees us, not our culture, not the people around us, perhaps, I hate to even say this, maybe family or whatever, but we don't want to see ourselves in that way. We want to see ourselves in the way God sees us. That's the important thing. The problem is that our tendency is to look everywhere else but up. Everywhere else but up. Uh, we look to and at other people. We look at our culture to understand who we are. But instead, B, her self-esteem is based on a relationship with God. Her, her self-esteem really needs to be based on her relationship with God is uh, what that verse is saying. Now, how I look at myself is based on and is a result of my relationship with the, the one who sees me as a royal princess based on nothing other than because I belong to him. I'm a princess because I belong to Almighty God, the amazing creator, that he loves me so much that he made eternity a possibility for me, a assurance for me. That's how much he loves me. Um, I'm a royal princess not because of what I do, how I look, as this culture teaches. I have self-esteem because the Most High God loves me so much that he sent his son to a manger that we just finished celebrating in the Christmas season to become our savior, to die on our behalf so that we could spend eternity with him. That, that is a lot of love, don't you think? Wow. And I think sometimes in the hustle and bustle of life and um, even you know, in, our, in the holiday season and everything else, we forget the impact of what that means for the most high God to become a baby <laughs> to lie in a cow stall in a time of history that was not an easy time to live in, in a place that was not easy to live in, and on and on it goes. Why? Because he wants us with us eternally. It's amazing, amazing. May we never forget the importance of that, that thought. So that he can, uh, he, he did that, he, went through all of those things so that he could build an intimacy with me. I read uh, this quote many times before, but J.D. Greer, a pastor in, in North Carolina, said this, In Christ, there is nothing I could do to make you love me more. There is nothing I can do to make you love me less. Isn't that good? I love that. And um, I, I just want to remember that all the time. I want to remind myself of that when I get caught up in how the culture sees me or what I need to get done or what ha needs to happen in my life and all those kinds of things. I want to remember that there's nothing I can do to make him love me more. Wow, amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, as that verse said, which means fleeting. And... Um, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That is what a daughter of the king is like. Now, how do we get there? How is that possible? How can we practically live that out in our lives? How do I do that? Next on your outline. How can we be that kind of godly, quality woman? A woman that is so confident in who she is based on how God sees her. A woman who looks up, how do I get there? whose focus is upward, how do I do that? <laughs> Seeing that she is who she is based on our relationship with her Abba Daddy that we studied about in the Beatitudes, that new name that Jesus uh, gave our Heavenly Father. So we're going to be looking at, and that's where we're going to start, uh, in Psalm 119, verse 9, the very beginning, our focus passage, begins to tell us how we can understand who we are in the eyes of God. So, Look with me to the very beginning of that verse. How can a young man or woman keep his way pure? In other words, how can I be holy? How can I please you, Lord? What can I do to um, be 
who you desire, you desire for me to do. How can I be a woman who fears the Lord, is awestruck by the Lord, like we read in Proverbs? How can I be the kind of woman that God wants me to be? A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Fears the, lo the Lord is to be praised, as that verse in Proverbs says. Let's look at the second ha half of the verse, verse 9. First half of 9 asks the question, how do, how do I stay pure? How does a young woman keep her ways pure? How do, how do I do that? Ask the question. Second half answers the question by guarding it according to your word. In other versions say, living according to your word. Living according to your word. What does that mean? What does living according to your word mean? Well, it means living in obedience, doesn't it? To be obedient to God. So A on your outline first, I need to obey. I need to obey. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's pretty clear. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. Throughout scripture, God has instructed us that our intimacy with him is based on our faithful obedience to him. God's commandments are not to cause us to have boring, miserable lives. Like sometimes we think, oh my goodness, I don't know, you know, what, what are some of those commandments that I have to keep? And is, is, is it going to just kind of, you know, tie me up in knots? Or, you know, what does that look like? And we need to remember that God's commandments are just the opposite. That they are to give us full, give our lives full of joy and meaning. And when we don't follow his good plan for our welfare, we disconnect in relationship with him. That doesn't mean we lose our relationship with him, but we can disconnect from him when we're not being obedient to following his commands. If we disobey, we disconnect. He doesn't love us any less, like we just talked about. We disconnect. When we are unfaithful to our relationship, we can cause ourselves deep pain. Now let me give you an example. What if I said to Bob, Oh, I, of course I love you. I love you, love you, love you. But um, I'm going to live my life just kind of the way I want to live it. I'm going to kind of do what I want to do. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to see who I want to see. I'm going to, um, you know, go on trips by myself and all that. Oh, yeah, I love you. Now, how would that be received? Not so well, right? Because when we say I love you to somebody, our actions need to demonstrate that love. How much more to our perfect Heavenly Father. Our lifestyle, our obedience needs to be to Him to prove that we have a relationship with Him, that we love Him. For my relationship to grow and flourish, I need to be faithful to Him and to our relationship. Uh, I've got to respond to relationship rules that God has given us, because they're for our own good, for goodness sake. They're for our own good. I need to be living according to your word, as verse 9 says, obedient. Now, how do I do that? The verse goes on to say, look at verse 10 with me. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. So first, obey. Secondly, I seek. I seek. What does that mean? Great place to start. Uh, to pursue or search is what seek means. How, do, how are we to do that? How do we pursue or search? In the verse, it says, with my whole heart, which means, number one, I seek with diligence. Diligence. That, that, that means when I seek with diligence that it's going to be a priority. It's not just haphazard. Oh, yeah, you know, I feel like seeking you today, or you know, I, I feel like I want to have a connect with you today, God. No, it is something that is a priority in our lives, not just haphazard. Now think about this. If you were seeking, you met somebody in Bible study, and you said, wow, I really connect with her. I'd love to develop that friendship. What would you do? You'd ask her out to lunch. You'd call her. Hey, how can I pray with you and all that? We do things to develop relationships, don't we? How much more with our mighty God who loves us unconditionally? <clears throat> it's kind of like uh, when you first fell in love. And you all know that I met Bob at uh, Maryville College and um, about December or, or January, February, things started really escalating. And wow, I, we were starting to think, is this going to be, you know, a permanent relationship? And so guess what we did? We started spending a lot of time together. And um, 
so don't ask me about my spring term grades, please, because. <laughs> but isn't that the truth, that when we are developing a friendship or falling in love with somebody or whatever, that we spend, we love spending time with him. We seek, and that's the idea here in this verse. There was a young woman in one of the Bible studies earlier that had just become a, a Christian. She just started studying, and she was blown away by all that the Bible had to say. And she says, now how, tell me, how do I get one of those study Bible things yeah. where I can get in deeper and deeper and deeper? And I just thought that was so beautiful. She, she was developing this relationship with her father, and it caused her to want to seek him in a deeper level. Wow, that's what we're talking about. Not only diligence, but closely related. Number two, I seek with persistence. Persistence. I keep up with the diligence. Not only am I diligent for a day or a month or a week, um, not just for January. Oh, new start, so I'm going to really you know, spend time with the Lord. And, oh, okay, February, things are getting a little bit busy. And then March, oh, and then we have summer. Oh, my goodness. And sometimes we kind of dip down, don't we? And so we're, we're supposed to pursue with diligence, not only diligence for a day or a week or month, but I persist. I persist in it. Um, if we spend only a few minutes a week or even a day, how will that relationship really grow? Put another way, think about the most godly person you know, somebody that you respect the most spiritually. Maybe it's your pastor or his wife, or maybe Beth Moore, or maybe Billy Graham or Ruth Graham or something like that. And, you, and think about that. You think, wow, if I could spend an hour with Ruth Graham, wow, that would be life-changing in my walk with the Lord. Um, but don't you think that your attitudes and your ways of reacting to things would be radically and dramatically changed if not only you met with somebody that was a strong believer, but God himself? Would that radically change us? Absolutely. With the King of Kings, wow, what a radical and life-changing experience that would be. So I challenge all of us to make an appointment with God every single day, to commit to spend a block of time with him persistently, diligently. No, diligently, persistently. I'm going with the outline there. Uh, but anyway, uh, in this new year, because it will radically change our lives, radically change our lives. Not only make it, but keep the appointment. Don't we do that sometimes? Oh, Lord, just oh, so busy. I got to keep this appointment with the doctor's office or with my haircut. And we tend to think those things are of so, so much importance to keep the, uh, you know, the appointment. And then yet we can say, okay, Lord, I'll get back to you later on today. Oh, goodness. And oh, my goodness, I'm going to bed and I never did have my devos spend time with the Lord. Wow. Anyway, we're so careful about human appointments. And yet sometimes why, uh, uh, for some reason, we are not diligent about keeping our appointments with <sighs> Almighty God. Wow. So three I seek with communicating, communicating. How do I do that? Like any other communication, when we're communicating with God, there's a give and a take. We pray to, with him. We talk to him. And then so often he'll speak right back to us through his word. How many times have you been, you know, maybe with me I journal and I'm struggling with something and trying to understand something and talking to the Lord through journaling and then all of a sudden I'll go to open that the passage of scripture I'm reading that day and I'm like Jesus are you sitting right next to me here that you heard me say yes he is <laughs> and the point is that so often he will give us words right back from his word to help us understand something that perhaps we're struggling with or praying diligently about so it's a communication um, it's um, opening God's word and reading uh, uh, what he, he puts in front of us or studying your homework. Uh, we want to be so careful about not just having a five-minute, reading some five-minute tidbit from somebody else's opinion about the Lord. We want to communicate with him. We want to communicate with him. Um, it's, um, you know, we, we, we need to not only read um, his word and study, but um, we need to be praying. And um, praying sometimes can sound very daunting, does can it? It sounds so religious sometimes, like, you know, do I need to speak in King James Version? Our mighty Heavenly Father, 
I worship thee today. And would, you, would thou show me your dream? And sometimes we feel that way, and that's not what it is at all, is it? We're communicating with our Father. The proper way to do it is what causes you to be able to open your heart more and more to the Heavenly Father. For me, we all have our ways. For me, it's journaling, like I just said. With Bob, he gets in the car and he talks out loud. God, I just really need to talk to you about blah, 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 blah. And he, he speaks out loud. So every one of us has something different. But what we need to do is find how we do it and make sure that we are doing it. There's an author that I read a while ago, and what she loved to do was set the stage to meet the Lord. You know, she would make it special. She'd have an extra pot of coffee going, and she'd have a scented candle, and she'd always be in the very same place every day when she would meet him. And that made it be such an occasion for her as she began her day. Um, I love that idea. Then look with me at verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So first obey, then seek, and then see. I hide his word in my heart. I hide his word in my heart. Now that says to me, memorizing his word. Wow, that's a bit daunting, isn't it, sometimes? No, some of you are easy with it. But anyway, um, I'll never forget when Tori, my daughter, was in third grade. She had this extensive biblical uh, memorization program, and I would just roll my eyes to myself and think, oh, I, I mean, how many... How long are we going to have to spend on this where we get this before Friday when you have to, you know, repeat this, this memorized verse? And um, I was just like, ugh. But uh, anyway, and so one weekend we were invited by some friends who owned a boat. And they invited us to go out into the ocean. And as we were out there, um, a storm started brewing. And we start going up and down and this, and we we're all terrorized. And so I'm kind of looking over to see my kids and how they're reacting because they're with their friends in another section of the boat. And I saw Tori kind of holding onto the side of the boat, and she's her her lips are moving. And I thought, oh boy, I better go check on her and see what's going on. And so I went over and I said, um, "Are you okay, Dolly?" And she goes, oh, yeah, I'm just, um, I'm just saying my memory verse that I was learning for this week. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And she said, that helps me not be afraid. And I thought, wow, I'm t talk about conviction by your own child, <laughs> you know, and how important she had hidden God's word in her heart. And so when she was in that critical moment in her little young life, it came back to her and ministered to her, her and helped her. Wow. Another incident, uh, years ago we were studying the book of James, and this mom came up to me and she said, you know, I'm homeschooling my children, and my son um, has be, wants to um, memorize scripture. And she said, interestingly enough, he this week was memorizing some sections in James. Would you mind if he came up during the opening time and um, recited the, the, you know, his verses from James. And I said, oh yeah, that'd be wonderful. So he came up, he recited the entire first chapter of James. Talk about intimidating, wow. Talk about life changing, amazing. So when we hide his word in our heart, it is so powerful in our lives. What is it that you struggle with? You don't have to say it out loud unless you want to, but anyway. First, is it guilt? Is it fear? Whatever it is that you struggle with, there is a scripture that will speak directly to your heart. Directly to your heart. Is it a hectic lifestyle? Stress. Well, how about this one? Peace I leave with you. Let not your hearts be troubled. What is it? Fear. I am your refuge and strength, a very present uh, help in times of trouble. Hide it in your heart because the rest of the verse says, let me not wander from your commandments so I do not sin against thee. When you're fearful, full of anxiety, guilt, or anger, or resentment, or whatever it is, all those are wrong attitudes and reveals that we're not trusting God, right? And it's, it's causing a disconnect with God. So as we struggle with things that we are going to struggle with in this fallen world, if we can 
give them to God and find verses to quote and ask his help in those times that we feel fearful, stressful, guilty, or whatever it is. Do you ever feel like you're losing it? <laughs> Me regularly? This morning when I couldn't think of that name? Um, anyway, listen to 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and here it is, sound mind, sound mind. When our gaze is on the word of God, it will keep our attitudes and actions correct. It will keep us from sinning against him, sinning against him. Now next, verse 13 in your passage. With my lips, I recount all the laws of your mouth. I obey, seek, hide, and then D, I recount, I recount. Speak with my lips, the verse says. And I do that in two ways. Number one, praise his laws praise his laws, his rules, talking about his, his laws, his word. Are you discussing the things of God with others? Uh, uh, what are we learning about him? And that's one of the purposes here of our small groups. And boy, you all do that so well, where you are looking at a passage and why well, I got this from it. And the Lord told me that about this one and on and on. And we learn from each other, don't we? When we're sharing his concepts, his word, what new things God is teaching uh, you about him and we need to share those we need to recount them i have a, a beloved friend of mine that i rarely get to see because we're we have such busy lives and so forth but i love our relationship because when we get together we immediately start sharing what god is teaching and um we always say to each other malachi 3 16 and that verse says then those who feared the Lo lord spoke with one another the Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Isn't that a great verse? In other words, as we're sharing around our tables, as we're sharing with a, another friend, as you're struggling perhaps with something and, and, and you share it with a friend and we talk about it and talk about scriptures, guess what? The Lord is up there writing your name in a book. Now, that's in our perception, but the point is he sees it, he remembers it. And it blesses his heart when he sees his princesses sharing about him. Wow. When we regularly <coughs> are spending time with him, he will show us incredible things about him that we will be excited about. I recount with my lips his word. Secondly, I will praise him. I will praise him. It appears in the verse before, uh, in the passage, verse 12, blessed are you, O oh Lord, teach me your statutes. Praising God for who he is and what he does is throughout the Bible, isn't it? Talks about it all through the Bible, about praising God, praising God. And that's what um, uh, worship is all about. Battles have been won with praise. One of the most dramatic um, examples of that is found in 2 Chronicles 20. And it might be a fun thing to, to read later on, but it talks about how um, Israel at that time was about to go to battle with Ammon and Moab. And the Israelites were terrified. And um, after the whole uh, Israeli people got together and fell on their faces before the Lord, women, children, leaders, everybody, they decided we're going to pray, we're going to sing. After we pray, we're going to sing all the way to that cliff area where we're going to overlook where those our, our, our enemies are gathering. And they sang all the way to the cliff's edge. And guess what they found? The Ammonites and the Moabites had been fighting with each other, and they were looking over a sea of dead bodies. God had done battle for them as they were praising the Lord and singing to him. What a dramatic example that is. Or how about this one? How about in a personal battle as well? How about Jonah, who had really messed up with the Lord, remember? And he got swallowed by a very large fish. Now, to swallow a man, I mean, that had got to be a pretty large fish. And as he's inside that fish's belly, guess what he was doing? Praising God. That wouldn't be very praiseworthy, would it, as the <laughs> juice, never mind. But uh, anyway, he was recounting all that God had done. 
Wow. And when he was done, praise the Lord, guess what happened? The fish vomited about him up on the shore. Thank you. Hard word to think of. Anyway, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Wow. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that is a personal victory when I can praise in whatever the circumstances are. We talked about that in Lesson 9 um, in Psalm 100. Remember that we're praising not for the circumstances, but in the circumstances. Not for, but in the circumstances. Because that gets the focus off the circumstances and on the one who is in, con in control of all of our circumstances. Well, then E, we move on. I rejoice, verse 14. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in, in riches. Very similar to praising that we just studied and talked about. But what does it mean, uh, what does it say we delight in the way of your testimonies? Or in another version, I rejoice in following your statutes. What does that mean? Are we finding joy? and delight and pleasures in the things of this world? Uh, what causes us to rejoice? The great riches, as it says in that verse, are we jaded by the world that only worldly things make us rejoice? Things, experiences, trips, whatever, are, is that what, ooh, that makes me so rejoicing in my heart because I get to do or have or, or see or whatever. Um, or being involved in something big if I can just, ooh, if I could have a position of leadership or something big to do, you know, for the kingdom. I'll never forget, some of you will remember the name, Corabel Morgan, mm -hmm. who was an amazing <laughs> Bible teacher in Dade County. And she taught hundreds of women for years and years and years. And um, then in poor health, she started, as she was uh, getting older and her health was uh, sliding a little bit, she slowed down hugely. And I remember one time I had the uh, opportunity to just talk to her about that. And I said, um, you know, what are you doing now that, you know, you, you had all these, I didn't put it like this, but this is what I was talking about. After having such an impact on so many women, what are you doing with yourself now as you're kind of backing off a little bit and you're not teaching really anymore? And she said, oh, oh I had the most wonderful life. She says, I get to communicate with the Lord all day long. And she would, you know, if she did her exercises in the pool or whatever, she'd sit on the edge of the pool and pray, pray, pray. And she said, I just have this opportunity to just communicate with the Lord all day. Yeah. She says, it's wonderful. And you know what she was doing? She was praying for all the ministry people that she knew across the globe. Missionaries, leaders, pastors that she knew. She even prayed for Sheridan House. And um, she, she used that time to to call on the Lord and I remember thinking wow you know um, from a human perspective that just seems kind of like a small task for the kingdom you know when you think about all the people that you taught and blah 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 and it just seems like a small thing but you know what it's probably the most important job she did for the kingdom in all of her life combined don't you think Committing all of these ministry people to the Lord. Wow, what an amazing, amazing situation. She was rejoicing in following his statutes, following his bidding, delighting in the tes her testimonies. Uh, in in um, my mother's latter years, when she was in a retirement community, there was another pastor's wife that she and my mom just loved music. And they would get together, you know, every couple days or once a week or something like that. And um, they would sit in my mother's room and sing the top of their lungs. And they'd sing choruses and they'd sing hymns and they'd, you know, sing all these things that had, had ministered to them through the years. And um, one of their favorites was a song that you all probably remember, Make Me a Blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. May Jesus shine. And that was their heart in their later years, just like Corabel's. And notice it says, out of my life may Jesus shine, or as the verse 
delight when we uh, when things doesn't they, they're not saying oh, when things are going my way I'm just going to praise the Lord I'm going to rejoice I'm going to ask you to make me a blessing when God answers our prayers in the way we desire them to go it is a choice to tr when the it is a choice to trust him and then in his love for us we will do what is best for us God knows doesn't he he knows what is best. He knows what is best for us, even though it may not seem like it from a human perspective. He is in control. That should cause us to rejoice. Next, I, F, I meditate, verse 15. I meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your way. It says your precepts, which means your principles or advice that you give. Number one, what am I filling my mind with? With what am I filling my mind? We are such a noisy generation, aren't we? We have our phones. We have our, you know, social media things. We have our Facebook and our Instagram, and we can't miss five minutes of it because there so, might be something posted that's really amazing and affects me in some way or whatever. And um, we are so noisy all the time. Have you been to dinner? and you're sitting, or lunch or something, and you're sitting and there's a table next to you and it's a sweet family, a mom and a dad and some children, and every one of them are on their cell phone. Isn't that sad? Not communicating, not sharing their hearts. Wow, we need to be so careful of that. In fact, most of our lives, we remember the day, um, say yes to me or you'll make me feel really old. Do you remember a day when we did not have cell phones? Yes before even flip phones. There was a time when we didn't have that distraction, did we? And now, today we're talking in, in the group leader meeting that if we leave our phone at home by mistake, we're like frantic. Oh my goodness. I'm going to the grocery store and I don't have my phone. And we just get into a panic. We don't have that, that noise connection in our lives. Wow. Um, we need to be so careful of that. How often do we really, in our lives, have time to meditate on anything, to meditate on God's word, to communicate with him. We're so busy, busy, busy in our lifestyle and in our connection with people, Facebook, all of it. Um, it's almost like we're afraid of silence. Have you had no people that they walk into their house at the end of the work day or whatever, and the minute they walk in, boom, on goes the television. Noise, 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 noise. It's almost like they're afraid to be quiet, to be silent. Wow. Meditating is a discipline. It's amazing what we will fill our minds with. I have to discipline, discipline myself several times to keep the house totally quiet. We're going to have some quiet in this household so that I can think about you, Lord, so I can remember those verses I'm working on memorizing so that I can uh, have a, a time, a special quiet time with you. With our hectic lives, it's not only necessary, it is mandatory. It is mandatory. How can God speak to me above all that noise? How can he speak to me? I have a plaque that somebody gave me years ago, and it says, be still and know that I'm God. And I have it posted right above my sink <laughs> so that, you know, the kitchen is all, usually the area where I'm going to be the most in the day. And I see that, and it's like, that's right, be still and know that I'm God. I can't really know who God is completely and totally unless I'm quiet, silent before him. I remember someone said to me that um, when she was driving, she finally she decided to finally turn off her car radio because she kind of she said I kind of felt like God was saying to me I refuse to com compete with the noise in your life compete with the noise in your life we need quiet to hear the voice of God in our lives and secondly to what am I pondering and if my life is too busy how do I have time or a situation where I can ponder anything of value. I think that's one of the most interesting words that describes Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the Christmas uh, scriptures, talking about her pondering. You know, when the wise men came, she pondered these things in her heart. 
And I think that, that God used that. I think it was a discipline in her life that helped her cope with the incredible things that were happening around her with Jesus. And then finally in the end, when he gave his life and then was resurrected, I think her pondering all these things in her life helped her tremendously as she dealt with things that were going to be happening to her. I think this verse goes along with verse 11, stored up your word in my heart. When we are memorizing God's worth, word and processing it and pondering it, um, it just makes such a difference. How about starting your day every day with a verse before you have your, your time of communicating with God. How about starting your day with a verse? I, I've told you this before, but I had a, a mentor in my life who every single day she'd put her feet on the ground and she'd say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. What a way to start. And then how about ending your day uh, with Psalm 121 that we studied a few, a couple months ago. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He is my keeper. I love that one. And um, next week, we're going to be studying Psalm 127, and it says, He gives his beloved sleep. Can I tell you how many times I prayed that one in the night? <laughs> Lord, I'm your beloved. Please give me sleep at 2 a.m. But anyway, um, beginning your day and ending your day. And then next, G, I delight. I delight. Look at verse, the beginning of verse 16. I will delight in your statutes. Number one. What do I delight in? Honestly, really. What do you delight in? Think about your life and what brings you the most joy and pleasure. Is it a wonderful meal? Is it uh, chocolate? <laughs> that ain't all bad, is it? Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, is it going to the mall? What is it that really brings joy and delight? A woman who's looking up delights in God's statues or decrees and in him. So what do I delight in? Number two, how do I delight? Wow, think about the things you delight in. Isn't that something that you just kind of, you know, experience and enjoy and ponder and all the words that we've been talking about? Um, we have a tradition in the Barnes family year, house for years where we love Cadbury eggs at Easter. Have you ever had one of those? <sighs> and what we would do is we'd all sit down on the couch and we'd say, okay, now first of all, I want you to look hard at the Cadbury egg. Remember what's inside and think about it and how wonderful this is to have this opportunity to eat this amazing piece of chocolate. Okay, now you can peel back the wrapper and now sniff it. <laughs> Ponder what it's gonna taste like. And then you peel back all of the wrapper and you can lick it a little bit. <laughs> and then finally, you can take a bite. And we used to call that an experience. We're gonna experience a Cadbury egg. Wow, and that's, you know, that's what we, need to, what we need to be doing with God's word and with our relationship with him. It's kinda like when I go out with Bob. I love to smell his cologne. I love to feel his strength when he holds me. I love to hear his thoughts. I love to share mine. Wow, how much more should we be doing that with the things of God, with the things of God? Savoring, listening, noticing, sharing, and perhaps turning it around and doing something that would delight God. How can I delight God? I love that picture, don't you, of Mary of Bethany, who remember what she did? She had that very expensive vial of perfume and broke it and poured it all over Jesus' feet. And everybody was like, what are you thinking? You could have gotten thousands of whatever their coin is um, and give it to the poor, for goodness sake. What are you thinking? And she was lavishing. She was experiencing. She was loving the Lord. Now, obviously, we can't do that physically. But is there a way that we could do that? where we bless and lavish God, maybe by reaching out to, maybe anonymously, reaching out to somebody, maybe somebody that's a very lonely single person or, or a child that's going through a difficult time or um, you know, aging parents or a family member that's struggling with something or a friend, uh, whatever. Is, is there something that we could do to lavish on somebody else 
in Jesus' name. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? We can't pour uh, perfume on his feet, but we can lavish him in other ways, can't we? Wow. In his name to delight him. Lastly, H, I will not neglect. I will not neglect. The second part of verse 16, do not forget or neglect your word. What a great place to end is to stick with it. Stick with it. Decide that we will make these things a habit, a commitment. Um, some ideas, think of Jesus waiting for you in the same spot in time every day. Or again, maybe that retreat that that um, author talked about, how she, she meets him every day, same time, hopefully. And, you know, she's got her candle going, her coffee, and it's just like, wow, Jesus, I get to just spend this time with you and, and, and to meet him there on every, every day. Wow. Um, or, you know, otherwise, sometimes my excuses can come up. You know, instead of I obey, I seek, I recount, I rejoice, I meditate, I delight, I will not regret, uh, neglect. If I allow the busyness of life to take over, I'm going to miss out. It's my... I'm going to miss out of having that special time with the Lord. My favorite excuse, oh, I'm just so busy. Oh, Lord, I've got so much to do today. I've got the grocery, the laundry, the this, the that, the this, the that. And we can so allow our busy lives to just overtake the things that are really important in our life, right? We need to struggle. We have to we struggle with that. Then I wouldn't, if I, if I use that excuse then I can neglect my relationship. Isn't it interesting that we have time to do our favorite things that we think is, are really important? We have time for that, don't we? But if we could change our perspective and make our time with the Lord the most important, what a blessing it would be in our lives. There's a, uh, one of the presidents of Wheaton College in uh, Illinois years ago. His name was Dr. Edmund. And he began every day at 5 o'clock in the morning praying for each one of the students by name. And as God began to bless that college, and the numbers grew, and uh, so far, instead of saying, oh, Lord, you know, my responsibilities are growing so much. You've blessed our college by growing and um, all that, but I have so many more meetings and responsibilities. How about if I um, kick it back to one time a week? I'll pray for all the students. Instead, guess what he did? He got up earlier and earlier and earlier every morning so that he could pray, continue to pray for every student by name. He ended up getting up at 3 a.m. Wow. Now let me tell you something. During his tenure, you know who some of his students were that graduated from there? Ruth and Billy Graham. Jim and Elizabeth, thank you. Elliot, um, Josh McDowell, just to name a few of the people that were prayed for every day. And is it okay to say my parents were there too? Then oh anyway, um, but he, in his as he's praying, God raised these leaders. Wow, what a testimony! What a testimony! How do I keep my focus up? What does a daughter of a king uh, do to conduct herself? She follows God's principles and commits to them. It'd be kind of like if there was a woman that went on a cruise. And, you know, upstairs above her cabin was this, any of you who have been on a cruise, lavish meal that was served every single, well, many times a day, but, you know, particularly thinking about dinner. And, but the sad thing is, this is just a makeup story, but the sad thing is she didn't know about it. And so what she'd do is she'd sit in her cabin night after night and eat crackers and cheese. Here was this lavish feast going on above her, and she was settling for crackers and cheese. Don't we do that sometimes? We, God has a sumptuous feast ready for our lives, and we don't want to miss it by settling spiritually for crackers and cheese in our lives. Wow. Closing question. Are you ready to start the new year right, correctly? Make a commitment to seek him 
with all your heart. Make that commitment. That's the most important New Year's resolution we can all make is to say, Lord, I want to seek you in a deeper, more uh, valuable, um, committed way this year. I want to be a different woman because I've committed to be with you on a regular basis. Wow. I think we will all be surprised how the other things that we talked about fall into place when we have our priorities correct. Right? Right. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word that gives us direction, gives us challenges, gives us really important things to think about as we uh, begin a new year. Lord, I pray for each one of us to be committed in a way that would honor you and that we could become more and more the women that you desire for us to be, that we can matter for the kingdom. And uh, so, Lord, we just commit this year to you. I ask that you would help us and convict us of um, some of the busyness that we find ourselves involved with, some of the noise that we find ourselves involved with, and that we may, that you would be our number one first priority in our lives. So we commit this, this year to you, and I just thank you for these women who are committed enough to come and spend a day a week studying your word together with other women. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.